Welcome. So today we're going to get back into partial derivatives and tangent planes. So if you recall previous videos we've made, so far we've been looking at some three-dimensional geometry. So sketching planes and stuff like that. So uh, let's jump into partial derivatives. Now consider the surface z is equal to f of x, y, so a function of x and y given by 1 minus x squared minus y squared. And then consider this point on that surface. 1 minus 1 minus 1. Use the y constant cross section through p to find the slope in the x direction at p. So here we've got the surface. 1 minus x squared minus y squared, and that is z. The x direction is this way. The y direction is this way. And then, of course, z goes up. Okay, so the plane meets the surface in the curve z is equal to f of x and y is equal to minus 1. Now this is a function of x. Here g of x is f of x comma minus 1, which is 1 minus x squared minus minus 1 squared. So minus 1 squared is 1. So that's minus 1 at the end. So 1 minus 1 is 0. So this is just x squared right here. Uh, and then the derivative of that with respect to x is minus 2x. Now if we sub in x equal to 1, because we're looking at the point, I think it was 1 minus 1 minus 1, wasn't it? Then that's the slope. Okay, so how do we visualize this? So I'm going to give you a three-dimensional representation of this because I've already written up some code to do that. So I'll open this up, and let's talk a little bit about this example in more detail. So the surface z equals 1 minus x squared minus y squared has points described by this. Now what I've got here is a parameterization of this surface with only two letters. You see in rectangular coordinates you need three letters to describe this. So I've said basically let x equal t and y equal u, then this is our x, this is our y, and then the z value is 1 minus t squared minus u squared. So for any two real numbers t and u, I get from this description right here a point that is on this surface. And that's called a parameterization of that surface. Okay, so let z equal to 1 minus x squared minus y squared, then f subscript x, this is the partial derivative with respect to x at the point a, b, so when x is a and y is b, this is the slope of a tangent line to the surface at the point a, b, 1 minus a squared minus b squared, in which the tangent line is parallel to the x-axis. I'm going to show you a diagram soon. Now, to do the calculation, to see what this is, we have the partial derivative of f with respect to x. Now, we set it out like this, but what this means is treat all of the other letters other than x as if they were constants. So that means we're treating 1 as a constant and minus y squared as a constant. Now, if we were differentiating this when y is treated as a constant, well, then we just get minus 2x, right? And so when we sub in x is a and y is b into that, that slope is minus 2a. All right, so there's also another um, way of looking at this. This is the definition of that partial derivative, analogous to the definition of the ordinary derivative that we looked at in the previous section. Okay, so that is the limit as h goes to 0 of 1 on h, f of x plus h comma y minus f of x and y. So now let's look at a diagram. So here's a little bit of code in there. Let's ignore that for now. If you want to, I'll see if I can find a way to show that to you. 
All right, so I'm going to take this back from the beginning. And let's talk about this. So what I have here is that surface, right? That's in yellow. And then I have this black curve on it. Okay, what is that? Well, I've just fixed a particular y value. So in this case, I can see that it's y equals minus 1. So taking that as constant, y is constant there, then I've got a curve parallel to the x-axis. Remember, x comes out this way. Right? Following my mouse, it comes out this way. So this black curve there is parallel to the x-axis. All right, so on that curve there, I have a red point. You see that red point here? Okay, and now parallel to this curve and parallel to the x-axis is another red line. So that is a tangent line to this surface, and it's a tangent line to that black curve. So what we get here in the partial derivative of f with respect to x at some given point is the slope of this red tangent line. Okay, so now as I change, let's see, what am I changing here when I do this? As I change the y value, you see the slope of that red line does not change. That stays the same, right? And here you can see where I'm evaluating this. So I've got a slope of 2. And that's the same no matter what the y value is. Okay, that, that is always 2. All right, so what happens now if I change the position of the point in its x value? Well, now that slope changes, and you can see it's now minus 0.1 taken when x is 0 0.5. Okay, so if I keep going over here, when x is 0 0.878 and y is minus 0 0.52, I have a negative slope of minus 1.756 or so. All right, now if I change the other variable, that number minus 1.756 stays the same, right? So I'm changing y now. Okay, now to summarize this, what is the partial derivative of f with respect to x? Well, it is the slope of a tangent line on the plane passing through the point parallel to the x-axis. Okay, so I want to make this uh, code available to you, so I'll try to put that in the week two practical exercise. And remember those are optional, but see what you get from, from learning that software. You get amazing ways to visualize this stuff. So this topic, Calculus 2, or Multivariate Calculus, is very, ge very, very geometric. Uh, so you often have three-dimensional geometric figures that you want to think about geometrically and then you want to do your calculations algebraically. Okay, so moving on. So here is our definition of the partial derivative of f with respect to x. Now remember it's the limit as h goes to zero of this fraction with the denominator h. So we move a step forward in the h direction so what we have here is this is, so if this right here is our point, and then we step forward h like to here, then we can draw a line segment or a secant passing through those two points. Now as this point gets closer to this point, that becomes the tangent to that surface or to that little curve that is parallel to the x-axis. Okay, so that's how the definition relates there. Now, uh, what we do to calculate this, is we don't often use this rule, 
uh, we instead use rules for differentiation. Just like the rules you learned before for uh, functions of one variable, the same rules apply except for you treat all of the other letters other than that one at the bottom, you treat all of the other letters as if they are constants. Okay, now you notice this difference in the symbols here. That is a curly D that looks kind of like a backward six. Right, so that is uh, how we write partial derivatives. But there's another notation where you put a subscript, right? There are advantages of this and there are advantages of this depending on what you're doing. Okay, slope in the y direction. So this is very much analogous to what we've done here. Use the x is constant cross section. Now cross section is a vertical slice to find the slope at that very same point, one minus one minus one in the y direction, i.e. where x is equal to one. When x is equal to one, we have z equals f of one comma y, which is some function h of y, say, where h of y is minus y squared. So h dash of y, the first derivative of this function, is minus 2y. h dash of minus 1 is minus 2. Similarly, the slope in the y direction with x held fixed is called the partial derivative of f with respect to y at the point a, b. All right, so here's a similar vari uh, visualization that looks like what we have on the left of my screen, except it's the other way, right? And I haven't gone to the trouble of adding the tangent line and making that um, manipulatable, right? So that I could change the position of the point. But it's very similar to what I've got here. Okay, now this derivative is defined partial f with respect to y at the point a, b, and we have this notation two for it. It's the limit as h goes to zero of one on h times f of a comma b plus h minus f of a comma b. All right, so what we're doing is we're stepping forward in the direction, in the y direction from the point a, b, and we're taking the slope of a secant, and then we're allowing that step forward to decrease until it's a ba basically zero, right? So taking the limit of that gives us that secant slope being equal to the slope of the tangent at the point when x is a and y is b. So this is our definition of that partial derivative, but again, we've got rules for this. So we don't always have to use this definition to calculate with. Definition nine, a partial derivative is a rate of change with respect to a particular variable for the surface z equals f of x comma y it is the slope of a tangent line on a cross section, remember that's a vertical slice, of the surface. And that's what we have shown here. There is a vertical slice. I've got a plane, a vertical plane there, in the direction of an x-axis or a y-axis. I can't quite tell which because I haven't labeled it. See figure 52. Well, that's probably meant to be figure 15. Um, so let's change that to 15. F of F subscript X is the partial derivative of F with respect to X. This is computed by differentiating F with respect to X while treating all other variables as constants. Normal rules of differentiation apply. We simply think of the variables being held fixed as constants when doing the differentiation. Okay, so here's an example. Find the partial derivatives of f with respect to x and f with respect to y of this function, x sine y plus y cos x. And then here's another problem. So these, there's probably enough space here and here. Maybe I should have set it out better, but let's try to fit it in here. All right, so we'll write small partial f with respect to x is equal to so what I'm doing here is I'm treating the other letter y as a constant. Okay, so then sine y is treated as a constant, say c. So if I'm differentiating c times x, well then that derivative, derivative is just c. So in this case, the derivative of x sine y 
with respect to x partially is sine y. And then the derivative of y cos x with respect to x is y times the derivative of cos of x with respect to x, which is minus sine of x. So we have minus y sine of x. Okay, now the partial derivative of f with respect to x, with respect to y is, now looking at this, we treat the other letter x as a constant, and so the derivative of sine of y is cos of y with respect to y. So we have x cos of y. Okay, differentiating this with respect to y, well, cos of x is treated as a constant, and so the derivative of this with respect to y partially is just cos of x because the derivative of y with respect to y is one. So we have plus cos of x. Okay, great. Now let's do the same for this function, or this f. So I'll use the other notation this time. So f x is equal to, now differentiating this first term, x y cubed, with respect to x, we just have y cubed, because we're treating y as a constant. And the derivative of x with respect to x is just one. Okay, the derivative of x squared with respect to x is two x. All right, f subscript y is the partial derivative of this with respect to y. Okay, so the first term, x is treated as a constant. The derivative of y cubed with respect to y is three y squared. So we have three x y squared and the derivative of x squared with respect to y partially is just zero. Okay, so now that we've got these two, find f subscript x at 1, 2, and f subscript y at 1, 2. Well, we just sub in x is 1 and y is 2. So f subscript x at 1, 2 is equal to 2 cubed is 8. 2 times 1 is 2. So we have 8 plus 2 is 10. Okay, f subscript y at 1, 2. Again, we just take this function sub in x is one and y is two. So three times one is three times two squared four, so three times four is 12. Okay, well that's pretty easy and it fit just fine in there. The volume of a box V as a function of x, y, and z, where they're obviously um, the dimensions or the, the length of each side of the rectangular box, so it's the product of those three sides, side lengths. Okay, if x changes by a small amount, say delta x, denote the corresponding change in v by delta v. All right, look, let's draw a picture of this. So if I have a box, something like this, Okay, let's slice a piece off and let's call, let's see, what are we dealing with? Um, yeah, in terms of x and let's call this little bit delta x. Okay, this is y, or now this, let's make this y this way and then this would be z. All right, and so the volume, how does the volume change um, in this little piece compared to the entire piece, right? So the change in volume, well, that would be, so change in volume is this little piece here, right? And I want to shade this, so let's go ahead and shade this. Okay, so that's delta V. So how does it change as X changes? Well, delta V, let's just measure the volume of delta V. So delta V equals delta X 
multiplied by y multiplied by z. This is the height z. Okay, so y z. All right, now that's what we have right there. Yz, yz times delta x. Okay, now if this delta x is non-zero, then we can divide by it and get delta v over delta x is equal to y times z. Now, as x gets smaller and smaller, the rate of change of v with respect to x is just y times z, right? So we're essentially taking a limit as delta x goes to zero, and we just get this. For partial derivatives, of only one independent variable. Hmm. Have I read that right? For partial derivatives, only one independent variable changes and all other independent variables remain fixed. So that is, we're treating all other letters as if they are constants. Okay, so let's have a look at higher order derivatives. Now you definitely need a lot of practice differentiating things partially. So You'll get some in the tutorial, but if that's not enough, I want you to go and open up Stuart and find some examples and practice. And also, you know, it's a good idea to come into Mathematica, make up your own examples, like for example, f equals 2x squared y minus 3x squared y squared. Like this, for example, okay? And so you'd ask yourself, okay, I've got an example of a function. Can I differentiate this by hand? And then, you know, check it. So to check it, uppercase d f with respect to x, and this tells you the partial derivative there. So you can check that, uh, check your hand calculation, and it's very useful. So I strongly recommend that you get this software so you can do this easily and check your work. Right, which helps you learn. Okay, higher order derivatives. The second order partial derivatives of f, if they exist, and they don't always exist, they are written f subscript xx is d2f on, now that should be a partial d, dx squared. fyx is this again is a partial d, d2f on dx dy. All right, now there's a notation point to be aware of. So fyx is fy differentiated with respect to x. So this is the partial derivative of f with respect to y differentiated with respect to x. And so that is partial with respect to x applied to the derivative of f with respect to y. And so what I'm showing you is that the order of the letters appears in reverse order in the different notations. Right? So that's a really important point to be aware of. So partial f with uh, y x is the derivative with respect to x of f subscript y. And similarly, fxy is the partial derivative of f with respect to x differentiated with respect to y partially. And then fyy, well that's easy, that's d2f on dy squared, taken partially. Now if fxy and fyx are both continuous, then they're equal. Okay, now th remember, so I'll just put caution. Just take the simple function um, f of x, one variable function equals the absolute value of x. I'll just remind you what that looks like. It has a sharp point. At x equals zero. So on the right-hand side, the slope is 1. On the left-hand side, the slope is minus 1. But what is the slope here at the point? Well, it's ambiguous, right? It's not defined. So in this example, f dash at 0 is undefined. All 
Okay, similarly, we could um, turn this into a multivariate function. So, for example, take f, x, and y equals y plus the absolute value of x. Okay, so I'm pretty sure that f, x at 0, 0 doesn't exist, d and e, undefined, just like this is, right? So they don't always exist everywhere. Example 2.9, so returning to the example where f of x, y is x sine y plus y cos x, calculate all of the second order partial derivatives of f and show that these two derivative, derivatives are equal. So we've got to remember what those first derivatives were. So let's write those down. So f x was sine y minus y sine x. And f subscript y was x cos y plus cos x. Okay, so we want to differentiate these again. And incidentally, this is partial f with respect to x. This over here is partial f with respect to y. Okay, so differentiating again, f x x is equal to the partial derivative with respect to x of this. So sine y minus y sine x. Okay, so we're treating the other letter y as a constant. So this goes to zero, and then this y is treated as a constant, so we can pull it out the front. The derivative of sine x with respect to x is cos x. So we just have minus y cos x. Okay, great. And now let's calculate partial with respect to uh, y of f subscript x. And so what that would be then is f x comma y. So we've got sine y minus y sine x inside, and we've got to differentiate that with respect to y. Okay, so we're treating x as a constant. The derivative of sine y with respect to y is sine, or sorry, is cos of y. So cos of y. And then the derivative of this right here, minus y sine x with respect to y partially. Well, we treat x as a constant. So we just have minus 1 sine x. minus sine x, cos y minus sine x. Okay, now f y y is the partial derivative with respect to y of this right here, which is f subscript y, x cos y plus cos x. Okay, we're treating x as a constant. So we pull x out the front of the first term and differentiate cos y with respect to y and we get minus cos, or sorry, minus sine y. So minus x sine y. Okay, differentiating cos x with respect to y. Well, we're treating that as a constant, so it's just zero. So our second derivative of y with respect to y is minus x sine y. Okay, last one f subscript y x is equal to the partial derivative with respect to x of f subscript y. So of x cos y plus cos x. All right, so the derivative of x cos y with respect to x partially, well, y is treated as a constant, so we just have cos y for that. 
And then the derivative of cos x with respect to x partially is minus sine of x. Okay, do these two match? Yes, they do. So this is fxy. fyx is fyx. Example 2.10. Suppose the radius of a cylinder decreases at a rate of minus 2 centimeters per second. Now, incidentally, this, there's a typo in here somewhere. This down here should be meters, and this also meters. Okay, so change those two. How fast is the volume decreasing when r is equal to 1 meter and h is equal to 1 meter? So in other words, r is equal to 100 centimeters and h is equal to 200 centimeters. So the volume of a cylinder is given by pi r squared h. So let's draw a picture. Usually helps. This is h, then we've got a radius r, and then the volume is pi r squared times the height. So the area of the top times the height gives us the volume of that cylinder. Okay, now the derivative of v with respect to t, given that h is constant, let's underline that. h is treated as constant, so this really is then just a, a function of one variable r. Okay, but we need the chain rule here. So dv on dt is dv on dr times dr on dt since r is changing with respect to t. dv on dr is uh, 2 pi r h, right? And dr on dt, well, we're given that is minus 2. Now, when we sub in r is equal to 100 centimeters and h is equal to 200 centimeters, well, we get minus 80,000 times pi centimeters cubed per second. So, I mean, you might want to verify dv on dr is equal to the derivative with respect to r of pi r squared h. h is constant. Okay, and so if it's constant, we can pull out the pi and the h. And we're looking at the derivative with respect to r of r squared. So that's 2r, so we have 2r pi h, right, which is what we have up here. All right, next page. The chain rule for partial derivatives. So given f of x, y with x and y functions of t, then df on dt is the limit as delta t goes to 0 of delta f over delta t, which is the limit as delta t goes to 0 of f of x of t plus delta t and y of t plus delta t minus f of x and y all over delta t, okay? So that's the definition of this. Now, if f is smooth and delta f is small, we can relate it to delta x and delta y through linear approximation. So this really, I think from memory, involves a multivariate Taylor series or something similar from memory, but I'm not certain. All right, so we get the approximation delta f is approximately, and I like to use this for approximately, the partial derivative of f with respect to x times delta x plus the partial derivative of f with respect to y times delta y. Hence, dividing throughout by delta t if it's non-zero, we've got delta f on delta t is approximately f at subscript x delta x on delta t plus f sub subscript y delta y on delta t. Now, if we let delta t go towards zero, taking the limit of this expression as delta t goes to zero, what we get is df on dt equal to f subscript x dx on dt plus f subscript y dy on dt. So these two here are partial derivatives and these two here are ordinary derivatives. 
So when do you use this version of the chain rule? Well, you use it when, so let's write this, use this when f is a function of x and y and x is a function of t and y is a function of t. Right, so if you have a function of two, say, space dimensions, x and y, but those are changing with respect to time, then you would want to use this. Okay, so that brings us to example 2.11. Continuing with the previous example, suppose that not just the radius, but also the height h is decreasing. dh on dt is minus one centimeters per second. What is the rate of change of volume? So we want to use this version of the chain rule here. So dv on dt is equal to v subscript r at r comma h multiplied by dr on dt plus v subscript h at r t at r h times d h on dt Okay, so what are these partial derivatives? Now, what we had was V is equal to pi r squared h. So that's the volume of our cylinder. But the two um, dimensions are changing at the same time, say. All right, so we had, let's put this over here. So we had dr on dt given to us as minus 2 and dh on dt given to us there as minus 1. All right, now the partial derivative of v with respect to r, now we're treating h as a constant, so that is equal to 2 pi r h. And then dr on dt, well, that's minus 2. Now, the partial derivative of v with respect to h is just pi r squared, right? Looking at this, we treat um, r as a constant, and pi, of course, is a constant, so we just have pi r squared. All right, dh on dt, we're given that as minus 1. Okay, so why don't we just factorize a few things out? So we can pull out a minus sign, we can pull out a pi and an r. So minus pi r, and then what remains is 4 h. And then what remains over here, when we pull out minus pi r, is just an r. Okay, so when r is equal to 100 centimeters and h is equal to 200 centimeters. What we have then is dv on dt is minus pi multiplied by 100. And then inside the bracket, we have 4 times 200 is 800 plus another 100 is 900. Okay, so that gives us minus, uh, is it 90,000? Yeah. So minus. 90,000 times pi centimeters cubed per second. Now, before we got minus 80,000 pi centimeters cubed per second. So this is somewhat different. So it's, it's decreasing faster. Okay, example 2.12. If V is the volume of a box, so it's the product of the side lengths A, B, and C, then find dV on dt. If A is a function of t, B is a function of t, and C is a function of t. Well, again, we need the multivariate chain rule. So dV on dt is equal to V subscript A times dA on dt, but I'll just write that as a dash of t, and v subscript b multiplied by 
B dash of T and then V subscript C multiplied by C dash of T. All right now we can simplify some of this because if V is equal to A, B, C, then V subscript A treats A as a constant, uh, sorry, as a variable and B, C as constants. So we just have B, C. V subscript B, we treat uh, A and C as constants. So we just have A and C, A times C. And then V subscript C is equal to A, B. Okay, so subbing these in here, we've got B, C times A dash of T, and then we add AC times B dash of T, and then we have AB times C dash of T. Of course, A, B, and C are functions of T as well. All right, second partial derivatives satisfy the following. feel like we've already done this, but anyway. Okay, so here are the definitions of these things. Yeah, we've already talked about this, so here I'm just bringing up the notation again. But these things are in reverse order. Clarout's theorem says if f and its first and second partial derivatives are defined and continuous, then this is equal to this. Oh, I see. I've got some of these pages. Is that right? I've got some of these pages in reverse order or repeated. Yeah, that's right. I, these are the things I've pulled out. Okay. So that was the last one. All right.